Welcome to this session at um, uh, Kingi Tanga Day, hosted by Tipperinga Faculty of Law. My name is Wayne Rumbles. I'm the Dean of the Law Faculty. Um, I'm a Waikato boy, um, grew up in Pukiatua under the shadow of Mangatau tree, and um, haven't, so haven't moved too far from home. Kia ora. I, I took a little round trip to get back here, but um, back here eventually. Um, <coughs> So I've grown up here in, the, in Waikato Tainui um, lands. Uh, Chipiringa, the Faculty of Law, um, has a founding principle, three founding principles, but the one I want to just briefly talk about a bit now is our um, principle of uh, giving a bicultural legal education. Um, this benefits not only our Māori students, but also our Pākehā students. Um, and to me, it seems like it seems very natural that, um, and common sense that to understand your cultural historical context of your present is the way that you can move forward. But back in 1991, when the school was formed, um, this was seen as a radical idea and actually even a dangerous idea. Uh, but my commitment to, to the university and to the faculty um, is to ensure that we continue um, this bicultural legal mission um, in, into our 25th year. Um, and um, I am committed to explore and develop what uh, bicultural legal education means um, in um, 21st century Aotearoa New Zealand. Now it may be questionable that um, New Zealand needs more lawyers um, but what we, is, is certain is that we need more Māori lawyers. And um, at um, Te Piringa, uh, we have 30% uh, of our cohort is Māori students, and uh, we uh, want to ensure that we remain the law faculty of choice for Māori students. Um, in this morning's um, keynote, it, it was mentioned that um, we need to move outside our comfort zone so we can co so Pakia and Māori can coexist. Um, so, uh, and it's the fear of the unknown um, that sets up barriers, as the, the bricks and the wall that separate um, peoples. Now, it is unfortunate that there are not more Pakia here because I think um, uh, you know these days and these experiences are as important for Pākehā as it is for, for, uh, for, for Māori. But you don't really want to hear me talk about too much, so I'll introduce our speaker, uh, Rahui Papa. Uh, so Rahui has um, represented his marae in the Tribal Parliament uh, since its inception in 1999 and co-chairs the Ngāti um, Kōroki um, Kahrukua uh, Tribal Trust. He has a background in broadcasting and education and chairs of several community organisations from Kohanga Reo to tribal and community trusts. He sits on um, iwi governance groups. He's an orator and recognised authority in Waikato Reo and um, Tikana. He is um, Potikana for our, our own faculty, Te Piringa Faculty of Law, and other tertiary and corporate um, groups um, within the Waikato. We are grateful for his contribution to the faculty's programme. Um, for Kingitanga Day, which he has contributed to for many years. Whilst um, uh, Pari um, Kafia McLean, former CEO, cannot be with us today, as she's recently taken up a new position with NZTA, um, uh, Rahu, I'm sure, will fill the time. Um, uh, he's he's going to talk to us today about um, Te Paki or um, Mahariki. Uh, in, in its historic concept, concept with the Kingitanga and um, how that is reflected in um, today's um, actions. Uh, so I'll hand over to uh, Rahui and I'm sure we'll have plenty of time uh, for questions at the end. Kia ora. Kia ora Wayne. Uh, e mihi ana ki a koe uh, i te rangatira o te piringa uh, e noho nā koe uh, hei tumu a uh, mo te kaupapa ni. O ti rā ki a tātou katoa, ka hoki rā i roto i ngā taumata kōrero, ko te wehi ki te atua te tīmatanga o te whakaaro nui, whakahonore ana i a ki ngi tūheitia, uh, te pou e noho nei i runga i te ahurewa o tana whaia o ti rā o ngana tūpuna a kia ora te kāhuiariki. I ko nei, ka tangi ake ki o tātou mate, 
koi ni ko te ahua tanga e tūtahanga nei ahau i te ni rā. He anō, ngā mate, haere koutou, haere koutou, haere whakautia atu. Tātou te hunga aura ko a rū me mene mai rā ki runga ki te whare wānanga o Waikato, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā tātou katoa. So, uh, probably uh, more than half of you would have been here because Parekafia McLean's name was on the billing as well. <laughs> unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, uh, Parekafia uh, left Waikato Tainui as the CEO uh, recently uh, to take up a position, uh, uh, a high-powered position within uh, the New Zealand Transport Authority uh, and uh, has become the CEO uh, of the Waikato Bay of Plenty uh, for NZTA uh, and we wish her uh, extremely well. Our acting CEO was poised to fill the spot, uh, Donna Flavel. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Donna suffered a family bereavement, her brother passing away uh, this week, and so they're in the Hokianga, uh, and he gets laid to rest today. And so our thoughts uh, and our prayers are with Donna uh, and her whana. Uh, and so, uh, that, so what you see is what you get. He mai tika mai, ko rāhu i tēnei e mihi atu nei kia koutou kia tato. One of the things that um, uh, I was asked to talk about was um, how uh, does Waikato Tainui, uh, in all of its aspects, so Kingitanga as well as the tribal organisation, so um, uh, recently there was a documentary, a three-part documentary uh, on the Kingitanga uh, and uh, lots of it was about um, sharing uh, the ideas and the principles of kingitanga with the nation in the hopes of raising uh, awareness, in the hopes of uh, clarifying or demystifying uh, a whole lot of aspects as it relates to the kingitanga. The kingitanga is a key part and parcel uh, of Waikato Tainui. Waikato has become, uh, and from its inception, from the inception of the kingitanga, Waikato has become the guardian uh, of the kingitanga. Some people say, you know, uh, too strong, so uh, 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 there's no room for anybody else. Uh, but uh, essentially, Waikato has become the whariki uh, for the kingitanga, uh, a, a protective uh, cloak, if you like, uh, for the concepts and the key principles uh, of kingitanga. And so kingitanga uh, is reflected very, very strongly within the operations within the organisation uh, of Waikato Tainui and our uh, tribal parliament now called Te Whakakitenga. And Te Whakakitenga is about looking back as well as looking forward. So the visions of the past coupled with the visions of the future uh, should determine what we do in the current uh, for, for Waikato Tainui. And there's no greater symbol there's no greater symbol than Te Paki o Matariki. Te Paki o Matariki has become the standard, the, uh, the coat of arms, if you like, for the kingitanga. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break down the key core components of Te Paki o Matariki, talking about uh, the aspect from a historical point of view, as well as a contemporary point of view, uh, and how it is shaping uh, some of the work streams that Waikato Tainui uh, get involved with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So Te Paki o Matariki uh, is a very sacred symbol uh, within the Kingitanga. The design itself uh, was commissioned by King Tafiao uh, in and around the 1880s. Uh, and he, uh, after, uh, of course, the dark days of Raupatu in the 1860s, the confiscations of lands, and land, the land confiscation was ultra important because it wasn't just the land, it was actually the psychological damage uh, that it had done to the people. And so Tafiao looked for symbols from within the tribal history uh, to be able to shine a light of hope uh, for the people. And so the presentation today is from uh, you know, a perspective uh, of the dark days uh, of the tribe and into a brighter future. Uh, and actually, that's reflected right throughout Te Pakio Matariki. Tafiao called two tohunga of the Eo religion, uh, a very, very sacred aspect uh, of Waikato Tainui uh, traditional law, uh, LORE, sorry, uh, and 
they were Tiwai Praone uh, of Hauraki and Te Aukatoa uh, of Waikato and Ngāti Raukawa, and particularly uh, Ngāti Takihiku. Those two were some of the remaining tohunga in the Eeyore faith and the Eeyore religion, which was a traditional religion um, according uh, to, to Waikato and, and according to the Tainui people. They were a bit hesitant about displaying some of the symbols within the religion because it was a very closed-door religion. It was a very, uh, not so much a secret society, but it was only imparted to those who, ha who they felt were uh, coming up the ranks uh, within uh, the religion itself. And so um, they were very, very hesitant about some of the symbology uh, of the Eeyore uh, of the Eeyore faith. The Eeyore religion was so sacrosanct that they didn't even, uh, they avoided the utterance of the name. Uh, but it, it lived on throughout uh, a whole number uh, of things, and one of them is through uh, Te Paki o Matariki. It's become the coat of arms that was designed by Tiwai Praone and Te Aukatoa, and they took a whole long time uh, to complete it. And actually, Tafiao had to request more than three times for them uh, to uh, actually complete it. That, that was the, um, it was so sacred, and so the hesitancy uh, was, uh, you know, uh, stuck there. Te Pakeo Matariki is a statement of calm, uh, of calm uh, and peace. Te Pakeo Matariki itself is the widespread calm. Right? Uh, and uh, really it's a declaration of integrity, uh, and unity across a number of dimensions, from the spiritual to the physical. It's become a bit of a framework as well, not only uh, in a physical uh, and a work stream uh, sort of uh, look, but in a, in a very, very spiritual and historical uh, point of view uh, as well. It holds some of the key core uh, origin story principles uh, of Waikato Tainui within the designs. And so... Uh, you know, it was uh, very difficult, but we're thankful to people like uh, Peha Farekura uh, of Wahipa, uh, who was one of the last in the old Farewananga, who imparted his knowledge and actually gave some real uh, clues about the, um, the explanations for Te Pakeo Matariki. Two people like Princess Te Pua, two people like Dr. Peter Hurinui Jones, who uh, collated and recorded. Uh, some of the stories of Re Rore Erueti uh, and Peha Farekura and those ones of the Farewananga uh, in their time. And in turn, they were able to uh, produce that uh, for, um, uh, for the coming uh, generations. The aim of today is to provide a historical overview of the f philosophies within Te Pakeo Matariki a sort of unlocking the symbology uh, of uh, this design. If Dan Brown had written a book about it, it would be called the Matariki Code. Okay. <laughs> Along with the historical, though, it's how Kingitanga and Waikato Tainui are moving to put this matauranga uh, into practice, into a framework of action, into processes that, will, um, that have a... a, a a history and a beginnings from time immemorial to the present day and how we might look uh, into the future uh, for, uh, for some guidance, really. And I'm going to touch on that uh, just a little bit more. Oh, gosh. Okay. And so uh, the Matariki stars themselves... Uh, Contrary to uh, recent uh, findings from uh, associate professors and doctors of the University of Waikato, Waikato Tainui believe there are seven stars. And, hey, Rangi Matamua is right, but Rahui is also right, because there's no wrongs uh, in our history. E tikana, ngā mea e rua. But the stars themselves frame uh, uh, a number of stories just in themselves. So that's why I've broken them down into the, the, these about seven compartments that I want to talk about as far as Te Pakeo Matariki goes. 
and how they relate to where we are today, how they relate to where we want to get to tomorrow. So in our view and in our history, Matariki, along with Puanga, uh, rose from Te Raro, another name for Papatuanuku, into the heavens. Matariki going to live with Hine Takurua, or the, the, the winter maiden. And actually, Matariki, when Tamanui Tira, he was a lucky guy because he was allowed to have two wives. Hine Takurua, the winter maiden, and Hine Raumati, the summer maiden. And so, you know, in a, in a flowery story, the sun moves from the winter uh, into, the, into the summer and backward and forward. So Matariki lived with Hine Takurua, uh, and which is uh, prevalent around the end of May, June, around the, the, winter, uh, the winter time uh, in Aotearoa. And she actually led the pathway of Tamanui Tira towards the summer months and got so far that when the sun uh, or the, uh, the summer uh, set in, that she became invisible in the stars. Well, not so much invisible, but it was very, very difficult uh, to pick out uh, the Matariki cluster. In the winter, it's way uh, easier uh, to spot Matariki uh, and her daughters. And so Matariki uh, is the symbol of memory, especially to those who have passed. We remember at Matariki time all of those that have passed over the year, from one winter to the other. Because winter in a traditional uh, Waikato Tainui and Māori uh, form was the time where everyone came closer together because it was bloody cold. Eh? <laughs> and so uh, we remember Matariki as the memory, as the, uh, to, uh, to rekindle uh, those memories of those who have passed in recent times. But Matariki is also the herald of tomorrow. She brings the past and those that have gone to those that are still to come. And she, uh, and Matariki, uh, was a wahine toa, eh? was a wahine taia, was a wahine uh, whakapapa Māori. Uh, and so uh, Matariki would, would be a bridge uh, at, those, at, at a particular time uh, in June, generally around the rising of the new moon, uh, Matariki would hold, uh, a spe they would have special ceremonies in, uh, uh, to honour Matariki and the roles that she plays, not only uh, from yesterday, but for tomorrow uh, as well. It's in that sort of vein that Tafiao uh, said a tongikura, or a prophetic saying. He said, Kwaraka haui te papa o te whenua, kwa kitea haui ngā whetū e tū takitahi ana. Ko matariki te kairuri, ko atu tahi kei te taumata o te mangoroa. And uh, loosely translated, I've arisen from the depths of despair, and I can see the stars aligning. And matariki will be the surveyor, and atu tahi will reshape the Milky Way. Lots and lots of that kōrero is... Tafiao likening himself to Matariki, rising from the earth into the heavens, rising from the times of trouble and despair into the bright lights of the Milky Way. Whole uh, number of uh, those types of things. And Matariki ensures that the lessons of the past determines the actions of our future. And so pretty much uh, Matariki uh, is the focus uh, on the uh, presentation uh, today. Today, we liken the de depths of the, that despair of Tafiao to the troubles of the 1860s, of the Raupat. Prior to the 1860s, the Kingitanga and Waikato were a very industrious tribe, a very wealthy tribe, a very healthy tribe. We had mills, flour mills and flax mills. We had uh, a whole number of industry, uh, and particularly around the Rangiaufia area, was the food basket of the Waikato. That would be shipped up to Auckland uh, and um, sold in the markets in Auckland, traded in the markets in Auckland, put on to ocean-going vessels that were owned by the tribe that sailed out of Auckland, the Hodaki and Kafia. They would go to Australia 
to the Americas in as far away as London selling our goods. In the 1860s, however, in one fell swoop, uh, war and invasion into the Waikato uh, happened. Uh, and as a consequence of that, and as a, cons uh, as a consequence of that, 1.2 million acres of Waikato land was seized, uh, was confiscated. And so that sort of cut, took the wind out of the sails. Waikato went from a very wealthy and healthy tribe to a, to a tribe that was in a state uh, of um, disrepair. A state uh, that meant that the land had been taken, a state that meant that the psychology of the tribe had been shaken. And so a whole lot of that um, uh, happened around in King Tafiao's time. Later on, after uh, the Raupatu and visiting with uh, major leaders like Te Fiti, uh, Tohu uh, and Ti Tokobaru, Tafiao came back uh, into the Waikato. Uh, he came back into the Waikato and he made a number of mission statements that we call Tongikura. And those Tongikura are alive and well, or a lot of them are, are alive and well today. One of them was, um, there will come from my loins a saviour of the people. O toku pituake e mihaya e urukehu mana kafakata. And so uh, in the times, and it was like in the times of 1995 uh, to the times of Teriki Nui Te Atairangi Kahu and her, and her brother uh, Ta Te Kotahi Mahuta. They moved from the darkness uh, of the Raupatu into, into the star shone path of settlement because there were very few footprints in the sand in 1995. There were, there were some settlements of the crown but there were no major uh, iwi settlements of the crown that took into account uh, those uh, types of things. And Te Kotahi actually said that it was about time that Waikato moved from um, uh, the grief-stricken state of remembering Raupatu into a period of development. And so uh, he said uh, a pathway uh, into that development from 1995, some uh, 21 years uh, ago. But the settlement was a beginning, not an end. The settlement set in place a whole new pathway to, to traverse and to walk down. Our past had dictated that there were a number uh, of trials and tribulations. There were some good times as well. And Te Kotahi wanted to set the tribe onto a pathway of uh, getting back to the golden years of Waikato Tainui prior to Raupatu, to the times where we were industrious, to the times where we were trading, to the times where we were prosperous, that we were healthy, that we were happy. And in those times, Kingitanga was uh, at the height of its, of its uh, existence. And he wanted to set forward on a pathway to get back to those times. So we're actually reaching back into the past to determine what we do in our future. In our tradition, Matariki, the Waikato Tairui tradition, just going to make that clear again, just in case uh, Dr. Mata Mua is amongst us somewhere. But uh, in our traditions, Matariki had six daughters, and each of them held their own reminders. And so you'll see the star cluster of seven on every Kingitanga flag. Right from the times of Tafiao, right through to King Itu Heitia, the Matariki cluster uh, has been uh, prevalent on each uh, of their personal standards. It's also been uh, a reminder about our traditional past and our origin stories. And so, in our view, uh, there were uh, a set of twins, the, the eldest of the children, Waiti. Waiti reminds us, uh, in our view, of Te Hau and Te Ha, the wind and the very air that we breathe. So a lot of them remind us about those essential aspects that we need as people, not only as people, but as tangata Māori and tangata whenua. And so Waiti reminds us of Te Hau me te ha. The, air, the wind 
and the air. Waita tells us about the water, the tidal salt water and the fresh wai Māori. Air and water, some of the key elements of our, our very uh, existence. Waipunarangi talks about the rain, the snow, the, the moistness of the morning dew. All of those things are from an elemental uh, point, of, uh, point of view. So in our view, Matariki is about our environment. Tupu uh, the growth of foods and of rongoa. So not only for food to sustain uh, the body, but rongoa also to heal us uh, when we're, uh, and that's in a, both in a physical and in a, and in a spiritual sense. Yeah. Rongoa is not just about Māori medicines, it's about the karakia uh, and those types of things that go with it uh, as well. Tupuarangi, talking about the shelter and the clothing, the tools of traditional arts, all of those uh, types of things are remembered uh, with uh, Tupuarangi. And the Portiki, Ururangi, the youngest, is talk, reminds us about our own um, uh, place um, in the world. Our, uh, it talks about mankind. And it makes sure the Portiki is the youngest one. Yeah? All of the Tuakana have a responsibility to look after the Portiki. And so here we are as people, as mankind, with our tuakana, with all of the elements that help us to remain uh, health, uh, healthy uh, and safe in our uh, world view. And so it, uh, Ururangi uh, talks about the elements uh, and the environment as it relates to us as people. And so the seven stars all have their particular reminders. And every time Matariki shines in the, in the sky is a reminder about all of these types of things, about our mortality, about the things we have to rely on. Our, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the kai that we eat, all of those types of things are reflected in our view within the Matariki stars. Matariki and her daughters show us of the relationship, our relationship to our surroundings. We were very environmentally focused, uh, uh, and we're still environmentally focused. And we rely on our relatives, the other stars, the other reminder stars of the Matariki, to, to simply survive. Today, our tribal aspirations, are the care and protection of these essential elements, both in an environmental sense, in a physical sense, and in a spiritual sense. A whole lot of those types of things have guided us in the development of our very tikanga, of our very reo. The reo that we say uh, today comes from the background of those uh, reminder elements of Matariki. You know, tribal groups have been accused, um, and some of them uh, rightly so, uh, of focusing on forestry, farming, fish, and whenua. And those are all part of our Matariki story, so we make no apologies for those. But, essential, but uh, another essential component is another F word, whānau. Hey. Uh, you got it, bro. Too. Coupled with our environmental aspects has to be the sustaining of the health and well-being of our families. Young, old, and in the middle. Nuclear, extended. Cousins, brothers from another mother. You know, all of those types of things are all reflected in the reminders that Matariki provides, not only every year, but every day. Because Matariki although difficult to see, is always there. Matariki is a constant. Hey. Mate ngaro ngaro te tangata, koi tu na fetu o te rangi. Hey. People, we come and go. 
But these reminders have been there from the dawning of time and they will be there long after we're gone. And the keys of Matariki, it's our responsibility to pass those to the coming generations so that they can understand their heritage, their legacy, that, is, that are uh, the stars uh, of Matariki. Another core component of Te Pakio Matariki is the symbol of Manawa, or the pulsating heart. Reminding us that, uh, well, um, our Manawa talks about our whakapono, belief in the spirit. Manawa reminds us of Tupato, to take care. Manawa also reminds us of our values and our core principles. The core principles of the Kingitanga and of Waikato Taidu. You can see in the uh, Manawa that there is an alien figure on the top, alien to traditional Māori belief. Okay. And that's because T.Y. Praune uh, and Te Ao Katoa really, really thought about it. They felt that there were some real, there were some close alignments between the knowledge that they held in the ancient uh, Whare Wananga to those of the Old Testament of the Bible. And so the Bible became the crown of the King Itanga. Pōtato te whero whero wasn't crowned with gold and silver uh, and emeralds and rubies. He was crowned and anointed with the oil uh, and the Bible. And I, and I acknowledge uh, the Tumuaki uh, Anaru Thompson uh, who uh, consecrated that same Bible on the head of Kingi Tuhetia in 2006. And so that's become, the Bible has become the platform, it's become the foundation uh, of uh, the Kingitanga. And so it was incorporated, the cross was incorporated into the design of Te Pakeo Matariki in the times of King Tafia. Tafia, or when he was born, um, Tukaroto Matutaira, uh, well, Tukaroto, and then he was christened three times in three separate uh, denominations in the Catholic, in the uh, Wesleyan or the Methodist, and in the Anglican. And people said, thought, why get christened into three different churches? No. My simple answer was, I think the old people thought it was a dollar each way into how to get into heaven. No. It was like, uh, if the Angies were right, choice. If the Catholics were right, still choice. No. And so um, that was reflected. And part of that was, even though Te Whero Whero himself never got christened, he allowed his children to be christened into the English denominations. But what he did too was he also made sure that they were schooled in the old Whare Wananga. So Tafiao uh, attended the old Whare Wananga at Kahuera and he also attended the old Whare Wananga at Te Paporotu. Uh, and thereby building the traditional knowledge with the knowledge of the missionaries and melding them together. The, the missionaries uh, renamed him, well, his Christian name became Matutaira. Uh, and so Matutaira or Methuselah uh, became uh, his name. Later on, he got a bit dismayed when after the Raupatu he was abandoned by those that were, uh, so some of his um, uh, great friends had abandoned him and they were part and parcel of those denominations. So he cast the name aside and took on a more Māori name that was given to him by the Taranaki peoples. And that became, then he became Tafia. There were a few other names, uh, but uh, essentially uh, though Tafia became the name uh, which he was uh, known by. So Kingi Matutaira uh, or uh, Kingi Tafia. Uh, and so the combination of the um, of the of Christianity within Te Paki or Matariki became another foundation stone uh, for the Kingi Tang. But actually, uh, Te Manawa has a number of um, symbols in itself, and we uh, so it reminds us of Kiatupato. 
kia tūpato i a tātou kōrero. So you see the two tongues. People say fork tongues, all the those types of things. And you'll see mata, uh, Manawa holding on to those tongues, reminding us that actually words can raise a person to the greatest of heights. But words can also decimate the wairua of a person. So we need to be careful. We need to uh, utilize those types of things when they need to be utilized. But it's but to be careful about doing it and to always do it with the best of intentions. And so uh, Manawa talks to us about the values, talks to us about the key and core principles. And so I suppose in today's um, uh, world, uh, Manawa is actually the symbol uh, of... Uh, the Māori king's personal standard. He's taken the manawa from Te Pakio Matariki uh, and set it aside as his own personal standard because of those um, uh, those aspects. Today our core values in our tikanga uh, are the litmus test within which we evaluate the merit of grants and distributions of our strategies and our work streams and work plans, all of them, in our view, have to, have to reflect our values. All of the tangas, eh? manaki tanga, the duty of care. You know, all of those types of wonderful and fuzzy things uh, that we talk about, kotahi tanga, mahingatahi tanga, all of those um, uh, things that talk about the unity. Because uh, the unification is one of the core principles of the kingitanga. So is manakitanga, looking after people. Whether they are visitors uh, to your marae or uh, to kingitanga hui, the duty of care or the duty of manakitanga uh, is always reflected in the pulsating heart of the kingitanga. Those core values and those types of things are actually drive to the heart uh, of where the kingitanga sits in a modern day uh, context. We talk about um, different uh, sayings of the kings. And King Ikuroki uh, said a saying in his time. He said, Mehe mea he mahi pai mo te tangata, mahia. If it's good for the people, get on and do it. Well, we all know Sometimes it's better to ask forgiveness than it is to ask permission. <laughs> Tafia also said, Kia nifa te ngākau ki te whakau i ngā mahi atawhai o te iwi. We must be resolute, and, and we, we must be resolute uh, in finding ways to look after our people. He wasn't just talking about his family or his wider uh, hapu, he was talking about all peoples, all peoples from all walks of life and from all of the corners of the globe. That's reflected in Manawa. That's our heart. You wear your heart on your sleeve, or we wear our heart within Te Paki o Matariki. The next aspect is about kōpū. Uh, and kōpū uh, is a particular uh, design. Uh, that was derived from the old Whare Wānanga. And if any of you have read Hetsuhi Mareikura, uh, the writings of uh, Dr. Peter Hurinui, he actually went on to design a number uh, of these takarangi spirals that reflect a number of different aspects. But kōpū uh, features as a prominent feature on Te Paki o Matariki. Kōpū uh, is the takarangi spiral uh, from the old Whare Wānanga. Kōpū is about reflecting our past, but it's also about setting our future. And that's why uh, the two kōru patterns there, um, they weave a rich history, a full heritage, and intertwines it uh, with a brighter future. The, the, the aspect of kōpū is that there is no beginning and there is no end. That, the, that it comes 
and that it flows. Our past and our future. Looking at all of our the richness of our heritage and legacy and passing that on to the coming generations as a taonga for our tamariki and for our mokopuna. Today, we learn the lessons of the past. And those lessons solidify our present. Our present will inform our future. Our past and our future are inextricably bound. They work together. And so the aspects of kōpū, the ins and the outs. Which one is which? You have a look. Because there is no end. And when you get to the end, it goes out again and comes back in again. It's the never-ending uh, circle of life. Circle of heritage that passes throughout the generations. Ko taku muri, taku mua. And that's a bit of a play on words. And that was constructed uh, by my uh, sister Pania uh, in a presentation. Muri is both front and back. Mua is both front and back. Hey. Kei vete tawa, kei mua yakwa. Okay. Hey. So muri and mua uh, are talking about in front of you and behind you. Because that's what kōpū represents for us. It is our past that is dictating uh, our future. Similarly to other tongikura uh, of uh, yesteryear. And they, uh, uh, so a tongikura, uh, people said, oh, you know, uh, that's a whakatauki. Uh, I said, oh, actually, there's a bit of a difference. So a whakatauki is a proverbial saying, whereas a tongikura is a guiding statement. Yeah? It's, it's not so much a visionary statement, because in a visionary statement or a kupu, uh, uh, kupu whakaari, uh, those things come to a fruition at some time. A tongikura is strategically worded because it doesn't have any ending. They are, as, tongikura are relevant, are as relevant as they were in the times of Tafiao as they are in the times of Kingi Tu Heitia. Mākua no e hanga tōku nei whare. Hey, when we build our house, when Tafiao built his house, it's a totally different house to the house that King Itu Heitia is trying to build. But that's what the intent of that tongikura is. Every generation will build their own house. Every generation will set their own pathway. Every generation will have, will have to acquire the tools that they need in, in a given situation so that they can confront the challenges of life and meet them head on. That's what kōpū represents as well. Kōpū is named for the womb because we all come from a beginning. When we go on to a marae and a waikato tainui belief is that we don't go on just by ourselves. Or when visitors come to our marae, it's not just about the physical person standing in front of you. It's about their heritage and their whakapapa right back to the beginnings of time. And so when the hungi happens, it's actually the sharing of whakapapa. It's the sharing of those that we can't see anymore. And just because we can't see them doesn't mean that they're not always there. That's what kōpū represents. It represents our whakapapa right back to the beginnings of time. It, rem it, it reminds us that we are going to create whakapapa until uh, time stands still. And so kōpū reminds us of those uh, core values uh, and uh, aspects uh, within the tribal uh, domain as well. The two gentlemen, and you can see how uh, Manawa relates to kōpū. Yeah? with the care and compassion alongside your core values. The two on the left-hand side 
is Aitua, on the right hand side, Atua. Two very spiritual dimensions that remind us about Tupato. Okay. About uh, people say, oh no, you can't have uh, Aitua or calamities and all of that sorts of things. Well, in our view, uh, <laughs> and probably uh, our own view, that the two figures represent the good and the bad. Okay. The good and the bad, because Anaru can, uh, can attest that there is no ugly in Tainui. Okay. <laughs> they represent the honourable and the scurrilous. And for as sure as night follows day, these two will always be amongst us. It's up to us, though. It's up to us how we employ them at different times. You know, sometimes it might be a little white line. And it's, about, and it's up to us how they relate to our hearts. It's up to us how it relates to our kōpū, to our beginning and to our next generation. In the modern era, I like to think that mistakes are made in the A2R sort of division of the world. But then, mistakes become lessons. Mistakes become the lessons that we learn from. Mistakes become those things that you are not doomed to repeat again because you've learned from your mistake. And we must be vigilant when it comes uh, to things like due diligence. Because, you know, in the Raupatu, uh, in the 1860s, or well, prior to the 1860s, we had a lot of friends, Māori and non-Māori. Waikato Tainui had a lot of friends. The Kingitanga had a lot of friends. 1863, when the government uh, sent its troops across the Mangatawhiri, quite a number of those friends disappeared. And so there were some that were talking. Some of them would say some things in the morning and say something quite different in the afternoon. They were, they were um, actually uh, being quite scurrilous uh, in their uh, approach to the kingitanga. Some of them, like uh, one of our um, fantastic uh, missionaries that was present at Rangiaufia, became the, the colonial troops spy. Spying on Māori, befriending Māori, and then reporting back uh, about, uh, and actually reporting back um, uh, with a bunch of lies that led to, that led to the decimation uh, of some of our whānau at Rangiaufia. Later on, that same guy took up a station in Oportiki and started to do the same things until uh, some of the other events happened. Uh, and that caused Raupatu within Te Whakatohe. Lots of those types of things is about who do you trust. It's about who do you trust and how much do you trust them. So in a modern uh, type um, situation, Aitua and Atua is about doing your homework, doing your due diligence as it relates to investments, as it relates to relationships. 1995 was a fantastic, saw a fantastic era for Waikato Tainui in that we were able to settle uh, the Raupatu. Teriki, with, by Teriki Nui's hand, we settled the Raupatu in 1995. The government of the day promised a number of things. They promised that if there was any governmental land that came up for sale, they would offer it back to Waikato Tainui in the first instance for purchase, thereby try, uh, aiding Waikato Tainui to repatriate the tribal estate that was once under the domain of Portato Te Whero Whero. Awesome! Unfortunately, over 21 years, there have been Breaches after breaches after breaches. 1840, we signed up, well, actually, 
Te Whero Whero never signed up, but uh, a number of uh, Māori chiefs signed up uh, to a relationship document called Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Breach after breach after breach. He kōrero i te ata, he kōrero anō i te ahia. And so those two have been with us, they will always be with us. There will always be uh, some things that uh, we find difficult uh, to find trustworthy. But then there's going to be genuine, uh, there's going to be uh, some genuine friends uh, as well. You know, and due diligence just doesn't mean in a Pākehā context. Due diligence means best practice, means the best tools that we have today, because tomorrow there may be another app or another um, uh, digital um, kaupapa that we can get into that is a little bit better than today. But it also means mounting those with our, with our hearts, looking at it from uh, a duty of care pr uh, perspective, looking at it from a values uh, and a core principles perspective. All of those things are reflected and they're, they're in the middle of Te Paki o Matariki for a reason. Yeah. With the ancient uh, ways of looking at things, we're always reminded about these uh, types of things, about looking at uh, those things, uh, about trustworthiness, looking at things like due diligence, looking at things like mounting our tikanga and our core principles into our work of, uh, on an everyday basis. And so uh, the middle part there uh, is Tipaki o Matariki. One of the, uh, and I remember uh, people saying, oh, you know, Eitua and Atua uh, shouldn't be part and parcel uh, of Te Paki o Matariki. You know, you're encouraging people to be not so trustworthy. One of the kaumatu of the time said, me pewhia e rongo i te reka o te tika, me he mea kaore anō i rongo i te kawa o te he. How can you taste the sweetness of righteousness if you haven't tasted the bitterness of wrongness? Yeah. Right. So your, our lessons, the past, become our lessons. The past becomes things that worked, things that didn't work. And they don't necessarily have to translate uh, into today, but they must be a consideration. Just because it didn't work for one generation doesn't mean it's not okay to try it again. But knowing some of the, uh, you know, to manoeuvre uh, some of the aspects of those lessons to suit uh, the tools that we have uh, today. Ko te waenga nui o te paki o Matariki. And then on one side of te paki o Matariki, we have ngā tohu kai. Of course, kai is an essential ingredient uh, in the physical health of the people. Kai was so, so important to our ancestors that if you look around in every tribe and in every community, the majority of their whakatauki, the majority of their kōrero leads or shapes or talks about in some way, shape or form kai. Because it was so important to us as a people. Kai provides food not only uh, for the nourishment of the physical, but it also uh, provides for the nourishment of the soul. You know, they say, you know, the, man, the way to a man's heart is through his puku. These symbols talk about just some of those kai. Yeah? Some of those kai that we derive from nature. But it also talks about actually hard work and the ethic of planting and harvesting. All of those types of things, hard work, allow our people to survive. The root systems of our native flora, the fruits of our trees, the birds of the forests, the fish of the rivers and lakes, 
all of those types of natural kai that our ancestors, that our tupuna uh, enjoyed. They made for a seasonal harvest that provided for the sustenance and the nutrition uh, of the people. Part and parcel of uh, those times also was um, uh, a bit of a a bit of a tete-a-tete, a bit of a uh, disagreement between Governor Gray uh, and Portato. When he said, Portato, put your kingitanga down. And Portato said, I can't. Ko potai ahau e te potai o te motu. Ko potai ahau ki te potai a te motu. And in other words, it wasn't up to him uh, to um, do away uh, with the principles of the kingitanga. And Governor Gray said to him, if you don't put your kingy tongue down, then I'm going to bring a cow. And that cow is going to drink all of your water. And you're going to have no water left. And Te Whero Whero said to him, my water comes from the depths of the earth. He mana wa whenua e kore mimiti. Comes from the depths of the earth, and you can't drink all of that, bro. <coughs> and so... Governor Gray said, well, I'm going to eat. I'm going to allow my cow to eat all of your kai. And the fiddle fiddle said, well, if you eat all of that, then I'm going to turn back to the fern root, to the aruhe, uh, to all of those things uh, that, uh, that uh, they look like uh, a poor man's uh, food uh, in your eyes. And we'll eat that. And Governor Gray said, well, what happens uh, when all of those are gone? Well, what then will you eat? And the fiddle fiddle said, I'll eat you. <laughs> So, you know, that there's case stories are uh, absolutely fantastic. In his time, Tafiao also took from a saying of Ti Tokowaru, uh, who was a, a major tupuna uh, in the Taranaki region, uh, and he took uh, a saying, uh, and part of it goes, He to to kai, he to to tangata. And that's part of the origin stories of the pokai. Okay. Pokai. Uh, in its purest form, means to feed the people. Yeah? To be a pillar that uh, provides sustenance of the people. And so pokai uh, have become a traditional kingi tangahui, where people come, they don't just come for the food, hey, although that's a huge part of it, <laughs> but they come for the discussion. They come uh, for all of the, uh, the historical and tribal elements that are part and parcel of pokai. Of course, how do you accentuate that? With a good feed. Eh? And the mana of a marae generally, generally rests on how good the feed was. You can have the most brilliant speakers on the pai pai, the most wonderful karanga ladies, the most beautiful songsters uh, in the whole wide world, and if you get a terrible kai, people will moan. Mind you, they'll moan anyway. Okay. So if you have an awesome kai and you have terrible speakers, they'll moan. Okay. But one of the essential aspects of the mana of a person is how well they provide manakitanga to the visitors. Yeah? And so that's reflected in Te Paki o Matariki as well. Remembering, reminding us that even if you don't have much, even if you have only the scarcest of resources, feed the people. Uphold your manakitanga. Uphold the mana, not only of your marae, but of your tribe uh, and your people as well. And so today, that's what Waikato Tanui has set forth on. How do we then grow the sustenance and the nutrition of Waikato Tainui people, because what's good for Waikato Tainui is good for the Waikato. And what's good for Waikato is good for the nation. That's always going to be our, our motto. If it's good for Waikato Tainui, then it's good for the Waikato. And if it's good for the Waikato, then it's good for the nation. Today, just throughout, and I acknowledge uh, Che, and he's koha of wai to the uh, awa o waikato. And he says, e kore a muri e hokia. So, kia ora na wātou. Part and parcel uh, of the Waikato River uh, 
is that it provides uh, in excess of 15% uh, of the GDP uh, of our country. And that's, that's because of the fertile lands, that's because of the river uh, itself. It's a huge, uh, huge amount. Uh, and it's getting uh, higher because, it, you know, Chase uh, Koha and the Koha of Waikato Tainui uh, add uh, to our whānau and Tamaki Makoto every time they turn the tap on. Every time they turn the tap on, they are experiencing the manakitanga o te awa waikato. A whole lot of that, uh, those types of situations, and that's why the Waikato Tainui feel so strongly about the care and protection of the river. Not only because it came from the sayings of Tafiao and, and those before us, but in a modern day context, Te Kotahi called, uh, said, No tata te awa, no te awa tata. We belong to the river as the river belongs to us. Not in a proprietary right, not in a proprietary uh, sort of context, but, but actually in a whanaungatanga context. We believe that the Waikato River is a tupuna to Waikato Tainui, not just a body of water that flows past at so many litres per second. We actually believe that Waikato was a tupuna, is an umbilical cord for the sustenance not only of the land but of the people. And so much so that Waikato took its name from its river. Waikato Te Awa and Waikato Te Iwi are synonymous with each other. I and I see Huri Wai Paki over there, so all the questions about that can go to Huri Wai, please. The other side of Te Paki o Matariki looks at uh, Ngā Whakamaru, Ngā Tohu Whakamaru. And so they show the essential elements of shelter and clothing uh, and the traditions uh, that goes with those. Because a happy uh, home houses a happy family. Safe and warm environments produce uh, uh, lead the leaders of tomorrow. All of those types of things. And we know that there is a, a housing crisis at the moment, even though some of the politicians won't uh, agree to that. We know that uh, actually some of our people are in those depths of despair again. And when it comes to shelter and clothing, we saw it over the winter months as Te Pua Marae opened its doors to the homeless. We saw it as people were parking up in Auckland parks because of the toiletry facilities and they were sleeping in their cars. And a lot of these people are employed. A lot of these people are employed, they just can't afford the rent of today, even with a job. And so they, uh, they hop in their car, some of them have tamariki. Tamariki pepene. Some of them were elderly. And so Te Pua Marae felt that they needed a, a place of respite, a place for a, a short-term gap filler that would turn the attention of the governmental agencies on, and shine the spotlight onto them so that they could be helped. Te Pua, now Manurewa, the, the, uh, our uh, whānau out west, at Te Whānau Wa Waipareira, uh, they were also helping uh, at Huani Waititi uh, and things like that. And actually, a number of our marais have been doing it for a number of years. For a number of years. It just hasn't gained the media attention of uh, the recent uh, crisis. And so, this part of Te Pakio Matariki reminds us that actually the tribe has a duty. The tribe has a duty but the tribe cannot afford to allow the government to abrogate its responsibilities. But we must work together. We must work together to fulfill those aspirations of our, uh, that are uh, shown in Te Pakio Matariki. Look, if we, you know, in the, this housing crisis, if the environment make it the man, then we must assist our people to be the happiest whānau that they can be. 
We need them uh, to be safe and warm. Those are essential elements. We need them to have uh, kai. We need them... Uh, so, without those key and core essential elements, then we're dooming our people uh, to, uh, you know, uh, a life of despair. And we want to um, raise them, uh, pull them out of that pit. And we want to allow them to go forth and flourish. But, like I said, we will never allow the government to abrogate its responsibilities in this area. Working together, though, will help not only the government, but will help the iwi achieve its aspirations. Because as long as there's one homeless person from Waikato Tainui, then the tribe has more work to do. As long as there's one child in Sif's care, the tribe has more work to do. As long as there's one Waikato Tainui person uh, in, incarcerated in prison, the tribe has more work to do. On an advocacy basis, as well as an assistance basis. But essentially, working alongside uh, our governmental departments so that they can get their act together uh, and uh, provide the assistance uh, that they have uh, promised to all New Zealanders, including Māori under Article 3 uh, of the Treaty. We know that housing, our shelter, our papakainga, that is part of the tribe's uh, housing strategy that has just been signed off by Te Whakakitenga. Part of that is moving people up the Whatapautama from homelessness into uh, safe and warm uh, housing, from there into rental accommodations and uh, uh, allow, uh, assisting them to be able to sustain uh, in, a rental, uh, in a rental accommodations, rental accommodations into home ownership. Home ownership helps not only that one particular family, but it helps a whole lot of families uh, at the same time. And so, with those, uh, with those, um, you know, climbing up the fata potama uh, or the housing potama, uh, that's where uh, Waikato Tainui uh, is uh, turning uh, its attention to be able to draw down the assistance not only from Te Puni Kokiri uh, and their. Uh, housing their kainga, uh, whenua uh, type um, structures, but also across the housing uh, portfolios of government, across the shelter um, um, portfolios of government, across the rangatahi uh, and the elderly uh, portfolios uh, of the New Zealand government. And we want to see our people, we want to eradicate homelessness within Waikato Tainui by at least 2050. That's not to mention, people will say, oh, that's too bloody long. Hey. And you're right. But, pe uh, but that's not to mention our five-year, 10-year, and 15-year milestones as we track towards that. All the time increasing the assistance that's available, not only to Waikato Tainui people, uh, but to all of those. So, like I said, if, if it's good for Waikato Tainui, then it's good for the Waikato. And if it's good for Waikato, then it's good for the nation. That assistance will have to be... So Waikato Tainui can advocate uh, on, a, um, on, on a, a pro forma basis, but that assistance should be offered to all communities within the Waikato. Right. This is not just a Tamaki Makoto problem. This is not just a poor naked problem. This is a problem that is um, uh, prevalent in, in almost all of our communities across the country. I know you're probably thinking, oh, this is just a soapbox opportunity for Rahui, but then <laughs> I And I suppose one of the key elements is the foundation uh, of Te Pakeo Matariki, Kote Mana Motuhaki. Very, very um, interesting that the two tohunga of the Eo religion actually put words on the insignia. Because generally, it's the symbology 
Uh, generally, it's the art form that speaks in their, in their uh, views. Right. But they incorporated the, the cross of Christianity, and they also incorporated Ngā Kupu, ko te mana motuhake. Everyone will have their view on what mana motuhake is. And actually, just across the way there, uh, Leone Pihama is facilitating a, um, a kōrero about people's different views on mana motuhake. Some of the key words and concepts, though, about mana motuhake is power, control, leadership, self-determination, independence, autonomy, self-reliance, sovereignty, and all of those are correct. <laughs> One of the hardest words to translate is the word mana, because there is no single concept in the English uh, dictionary that can cater for the expanse that is the word mana. Mana motuhake involves all of those co concepts and more. It involves also our traditional frameworks. It involves our origin stories. It involves our epistemologies and our, uh, and our origin stories. It involves, uh, and all of those are connected to our mana motuhake. Mana motuhake can be viewed in a number of ways. Mana motuhake can be viewed in a personal way. The choices that you make on an everyday occasion. If you turned right instead of left, then you end up, but that was your choice. Because right. mana motuhake is not only you determining your pathway, but it's taking the responsibility for the choices of the pathway that you took. And so too, in the view of the kingitanga and the tribe. It's not just about the right or left turn as we go through the points uh, on the historical timeline. If we did it, if Tafio had done this, then this would have... Hey, all of those turns have been made. But it's up to us to determine the right or the left turns that we need to make. But it's also beholden on us to accept the responsibility of the turn that we make. And we will be judged as sure as there's a matariki in the skies. Our mokopuna will look back and say, well, I don't know why the hell Koro did that. Right. Or they're going to say, man, my Koro was awesome because he left this for us. Right. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, that the... Uh, the self-determination that we create today uh, will be appreciated in coming generations as I'm sure uh, it will be and in the modern age mana is about shaping our own destiny the thing about mana is that in a democratic era the tribe giveth and the tribe taketh away <laughs> every three years Aye. but then that's the concept of democracy. Mana motuhake, in my view, is about seizing the opportunities to create our own destiny. It's about forging our own pathway on our terms and our conditions. It's about um, dancing to the beat of our own drum. It's all about, uh, it's also about the tools and the skills that we need to acquire to make sure that we can uh, make the best decisions when it comes to our part, determining our pathway. Tafiao again, no e hangatoku nei I'm going to fashion my own house. I'm going to set the pathway of my people. For this is the end game of the kingitanga. But it's an end that will never ever come because every generation will have to navigate their own pathways. Every generation will have their own challenges. All that we can do in the current generation is to provide them with as many tools, 
skills, heritage, legacy, best practice, due diligence that we can possibly give for them. The examples of today will help our mokopuna determine the pathway to mana motuhake of tomorrow. It's about our people, our ways, our way. How do we determine? How do we determine uh, which tikanga is appropriate for the now and which tikanga is appropriate for tomorrow? We decide that. We decide it on a personal basis every day. We also do that on a marae basis, on an hapu basis, on an iwi basis. Sometimes there may be some maneuvering of tikanga, a patua te tikanga, kia ora ko te tikanga. One tikanga uh, uh, will lead uh, to uh, a, a movement of tikanga that provides something that is tika for the people of that time. But it's up to us. <coughs> Praere Huata used to tell a story uh, about uh, two old fellas uh, uh, sitting in the wānanga with the young ones. And one kaumātua standing up and said, uh, you're not allowed to wear hats in the whare, uh, you're not allowed to smoke in the whare, uh, you're not allowed to wear your shoes in the whare. While the other fellow was sitting there with his hat on, having a smoke with his shoes on. And the young fellow says, hey, kuro, you're talking about all of those things, and look at that fellow beside you, he's breaking all the rules. And this old fellow uh, put his head up and said to them, when you know the up, the down, and all of the sides about tikanga, only then can you change it. Awesome, mate. Eh? He was experiencing and expressing mana motuhake. Here, my tika mai, he was expressing mana motuhake. And so, you know, that little story has a, has a number of uh, uh, meanings. Right? But the essential one is uh, that we must determine for ourselves what is right, what is tika for us at any given time. And that will inform us and hopefully we will have all of the information that we require to make the best choices uh, and decisions. Mana motu hake is, a, is a, the end game of the kingitanga, but it's an end that will never come. Because mana motu hake will be the aspiration of every successive generation. And each generation will achieve some, uh, some measure of mana motu hake. But each will leave a legacy and a stronger platform for the next generation to aspire to and to springboard from. Te paki o matariki is the symbol of mana motu hake because it incorporates all of those aspects. Tafia also said, Ahakwanga mano hudia tukitiha marietang. No matter how many people turn their attention away from the kingitanga, even if I'm left uh, with 100, even if I'm left with 50, even if I'm left with only 12, with God as my saviour, I will survive. Mana motu hake is also about those things that we find in our heart, in our spirit, in our physical being. All of those things combined is our personal mana motu hake. A mana motu hake that was bequeathed to us from generation upon generation upon generation. Something that is our responsibility to pass on to a generation after generation after generation. It's about strength. It's about fortitude. It's about self-confidence and self-belief. All of those attributes helping us to achieve some type of personal mana motuhake. And if we achieve some type of personal mana motuhake, then our whanau can achieve a type, uh, some aspects of, the, of mana motuhake. And if our whanau are strong in mana motuhake, so too then will be our hapu and our iwi. And if our iwi are strong with mana motuhake, then our nation will be even stronger.
just some examples also uh, about Te Paki o Matariki uh, and how uh, it has been, uh, it's evolved uh, throughout the generation. And you'll see in the top right hand corner uh, that uh, Te Paki o Matariki was the first name uh, of the newspaper that later became known as Te Hokioi Ereatuna. And so Te Paki o Matariki uh, with an adaptation uh, of uh, the symbology uh, itself was printed at the masthead of those newspapers in and around the 1880s. 1880s through uh, to the 1890s. Well, actually, by the end of the 1880s, it, they had changed the name to Te Hokioi e, e Re Atuna. And so Te Pakio Matariki was about the Kingitanga fighting fire with fire. Right. Because after the 1860s, there were a whole number of publications that just damned Māori. They damned Waikato for being rebels against the crown. Right. Rebels with the cause. Right. They damned Waikato for being, uh, for having a view of self, some self-control and self-determination. They damned Waikato for being, um, uh, you know, a challenger to the current, to the situation that was happening in New Zealand at that time. And so Tafiao and a number of his uh, strong shoulders, in particular Pātara Tetsuhi, who became the editor of Te Pakio Matariki and Te Hokioi, they said, oh, how enough is enough. Right. Quite fortunately, a couple of men from Ngāti Maniapoto had travelled to um, Austria uh, and had uh, met the Grand Duke, and his gift to them was a printing press. And so they brought it back, they set it up, and they started printing their own newspaper. Actually, it became very, very popular. Very, very popular. It was also um, uh, Tupu Tainakawa uh, and those sorts of uh, wonderful guys that added to the content. And they thought, no, bugger it. We're going to have our own newspaper. We're going to give our messages in our way. This is about mana motuhake. Right. Of course... As soon as it started becoming popular, the Pākehā set up a rival newspaper in Te Wamutu. And uh, uh, John Gorst became the um, uh, editor of Te Pi Hoi Hoi Moke Moke e Noho Ana i Te Tuanui o Te Whare. <laughs> Just imagine going into the local dairy and asking for that newspaper. <laughs> but because... They, they felt that Te Hokioi, uh, Te Pakio Matariki and Te Hokioi was just propaganda from these Maoris. And they were right. No. Of course it was. But if you can tell your message in your own way, then you're walking the steps to Mana Motuhake. No. Unencumbered, uninhibited by anyone else, who, who gives a toss? what they say about your messages, you're getting your messages out in your own way. It was a communication tool. But it was all to do with uh, the, the steps to mana motuhake. And of course, the doorway of Mahidarangi at Tūranga Waiwai uh, is also uh, Herald's Te Paki o Matariki. Really, it was created uh, al alongside Te Puea and Apirana Ngata, with the carvers uh, of the East Coast uh, and some of our own whānau uh, at that time, with the likes of Piri Pōtapu uh, and um, um, Waka Graham uh, and others like that. And they created Te Whakio Matariki on the doors of Mah Mahinārangi to uh, symbolise um, a doorway, a doorway from our past into our future and from the present back into our past, because it had to be the two-way street. It had to be uh, something that was, once it's open, and so they looked at those uh, types of things and, uh, and having those eternal symbols in the view of everybody. Sadly, most times when we have a hui, the doors are open. So Te Paki o Matariki is a little bit hidden. But we always know that that's what they, 
they're protecting that doorway. Because Mahinarangi is the seat of King Itu Haiti. His past inside the house, his present and his future sitting outside on the mana. And Te Paki o Matariki uh, is the, uh, the watchman at the door. Binding our past uh, into our future. And so, Te Paki o Matariki as a framework. Te Paki o Matariki as a statement of mana motuhake, of self-determination, uh, self of self-reliance building in the spiritual dimensions of our uh, bygone past, building in the, the core values, the duty of care, the compassion for people, building in our spiritual, building in our physical, building in our culture, building in our tongi, all of that is reflected within Te Paki o Matariki. And how do those things influence Waikato Tainu today? It's symbols like Te Paki o Matariki because, it's, because Te Paki o Matariki is also the, the, uh, the flag that gets raised every Kurunehana within Turongo grounds. Te Paki o Matariki, and when our nannies do the karanga to that particular flag, they say things like, Piki atura te paki o matariki e ki te pōwhiri i ngā iwi ki runga ki te papa o te ki ngi e. And so matariki becomes more than just paintings on a flag. Matariki becomes the eternal symbol of the kingitanga and its duty to welcome people into the fold of the kingitanga. It's about kotahitanga. It's about unity. It's about coming together. It's about te paki o matari. Hey, no? I can see two people just ready to snore over there. No reira. Me fati fati te kakau o te paipa ki a poto. E te iwi te nāku tō. Te nāku tō. Nā ki o rata tau ka. And I said to Wade, Oh, 12 o'clock. That's bloody too long. I don't have mine. We might have time for maybe one or two questions. Okay, we're done. Asking, uh, asking Dahu, 
as to why King Tunnel does not fly, fly the first stone upon all the The simple answer, in my view, uh, was that because uh, in the times of Portato, Ketitikakwa, that that was the uh, standard uh, that was flown. In Tafiao's time, he, did, he specifically asked to design uh, a standard that was within the uh, religious beliefs of the tohunga uh, of that time. So it was incorporated. So uh, one of the things that, even though the stars uh, are there, uh, uh, mainly with Mahurangi uh, or the uh, Southern Cross, that Tafiao uh, wanted uh, those tohunga uh, to come up with the standard. And Te Pakio Matariki was the standard. And so it wasn't so much laid to rest, but because every king has had their own personal standards. Eh? Whereas Te Pakio Matariki has become the generic uh, kingitanga standard. And so that's recognised uh, as the kara of Pototo. When we uh, celebrated the 150 years of kingitanga, there were a number uh, of standards. The triangular uh, flags were also flown uh, at Pukawa uh, and things like that. Uh, and, so, and so was uh, the standard uh, there. And, and uh, as you quite rightly point out, um, like I said, Te Whero Whero never signed the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, Te Whero Whero uh, uh, agreed to and assented to uh, Te Whakaputanga. Uh, he did it after, so in 1835, the Whakaputanga was born. He signed in 1839 uh, at Tāmaki there, uh, uh, thereby allowing... Uh, that mana, and that's one of the reasons why he wouldn't sign the Treaty of Waitangi. But uh, to get into the uh, sort of historicalness of it is that that was viewed as a particular flag of Portato Te Whero Whero, even though uh, it had been agreed to. Same too uh, to or to Mahuta's flag with the rainbow and the stars. Same too uh, with Koroki's flag. Uh, same too with Teata's uh, flag with the kahu. Uh, and all of those types of things, they are viewed as the, uh, within the kingitanga, I think, uh, is that they, they are viewed as uh, particular and personal uh, to, those, uh, to those kings and those monarchs. Whereas Te Pakio Matariki, by uh, virtue of Tafiao uh, establishing that, and Te Puea really in t uh, entrenching uh, Te Pakio Matariki as the coat of arms, as the standard uh, of the kingitanga. I think that's probably we're over time a little bit. Okay. So that's probably it. So uh, I'd just like to thank Rahui on um, sharing the symbolism of Tapaki or Mathuriki. Um, it was, this is going to be one of those talks that I think we'll think about for a long time. There's so many layers. I mean, I guess that's the power of, of, us, of symbolism, is that they, they resonate on a whole number of levels. Um, uh, particularly uh, the, a couple of things that resonated for me was the uh, kupu in terms of building a future based on a past and using that to um, ensure that our mistakes become lessons um, and um, having that firm base of core principles and an another thing which is it was the kai aspect um, my, I don't know if it's because we, I grew up in Pukiatua but Every time anyone was going to come to our house, our mother would round us all up, and we had to get the kai ready for the for the for the visitors. And it became a bit of an obsession. And um, uh, to me as well, now even in, in now, if people come to visit the faculty or if they come to visit my home, I have to feed them. It's just like inside me. And it, it is about um, it is about um, that hard work, work to sustain people, but it's also about food. As a, as a way of maintaining those social relationships. And um, also I teach in crime, uh, in criminal law, and um, it resonated with me in, in, in around the shelter, wealth, and safety of people is there's no use, to, if we want to reduce crime in New Zealand, there's no use building more prisons. There's no use um, having more police. Uh, the way to solve crime in New Zealand is to ensure that our, our people are fed, that they have a home, that, they have, that they're not living in poverty. And that's, I mean, that's really hard for a government who's only focused on three years, um, but it is something that uh, Tainui and also the uh, Pakia population has to deal with, otherwise we're never going to deal with 
do with crime. So, so thank you for sharing that, and it resonates with me, and I'm sure it'll resonate on multiple levels with all of those here. Um, kia ora. Kia ora.